I'm author Laura Hankin, and you're watching The Artist's Forum. I'm mixed media artist Dan Squirewell, and you're watching The Artist's Forum. Welcome to the Artist Forum. I'm your host, Elliot Torres. My first guest is novelist Laura Hankin, whose debut novel, The Summertime Girls, focuses on the joys and complications of female friendships. Welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. Oh, it's a pleasure. Um, so I'm very excited to talk about your novel. Uh, let's dive right in. And I want to know what, first, what inspired you to write this book? Great. Well, so it's a book about female friendship, as you mentioned. And when I had just gotten out of college, I was finding that these friendships that I thought were always going to be the same in my life, you know, the people that I grew up with, that I spent every afternoon with after school, we had grown apart and changed in very different ways. And it wasn't so noticeable when we were actually in college. But once we were back out living in the real world, uh, it became, it felt like there was a distance between us and there was the question of is it worth it to put in the hard work that it's going to take to make this friendship uh, good <laughs> in this new way of living that we have. So I was thinking about that subject a lot and then I was also just feeling really creatively stifled and so I channeled that into one of the characters who's a singer-songwriter who's very frustrated with the way that her career is going. And where did, did you always know that you wanted to uh, write a novel, or how did that come about in terms of the process? I didn't necessarily know. It's funny, I thought that I didn't want to write a novel, and then I found my old journal back from when I was 14, and one night I made a list of my goals, and writing a novel was on there, but I'd forgotten about it. I'd always loved writing and telling stories. Probably my crowning achievement was in second grade, um, when at the, parents night we all got to read our little stories that we written and everybody was like I like baseball uh, my favorite color is red here's a story about that and I was like here's a story about all my family secrets um, <laughs> <laughs> but you know that kind of went by the wayside for a little while and I was focusing more on acting for a long time but the thing about acting especially here in New York is you spend a lot of time waiting at auditions for other people to give you permission to be creative and so I was just feeling so frustrated and I decided that I needed something that I could do on my own time where I would only have to rely on myself and what was in my brain so that's how I started working on this. So how did you juggle the actual creative process of uh, writing and the discipline of having to write every day? <laughs> yeah it was hard it took some trial and error and definitely there were periods in my life like where I got cast in a play and so for three weeks maybe I wouldn't even touch this manuscript um, but I've been lucky in that I have some flexible part-time jobs so you know I could sing to babies which is one of my part-time <laughs> jobs and mommy and me take classes I could do that in the morning uh, and then write in the afternoon and it was one thing that was really helpful actually was that one of my friends was also trying to write so we would form a little writing group and we would keep each other accountable uh, which really really helped because I think if I hadn't had that especially in the beginning stages I would have just hit a rut patch and been like well that was a failed endeavor <laughs> back to checking Facebook or you know so you juggle between writing and acting what are the challenges that you find um, in writing that let's say you may or may not face uh, in your acting career I would say the toughest thing about writing versus acting that I've found is that it is so solitary and while I sometimes really like just living inside my head and talking to myself <laughs> um, 
sometimes day after day after day it can get really hard and I like the collaboration that happens in acting so probably the biggest challenge has been dealing with that but a cool thing that's happened is that I've found a lot of writing buddies not the same friend she moved away unfortunately but some other friends and we'll go to a coffee shop together and say like we're gonna stay here for five hours and take occasional talking breaks but for the most part try to actually concentrate on our work and you know I've now started writing a web series with a friend and so that's a very collaborative writing process which is cool and do you find that uh, for example with this book that people are recognizing either is this inspired by let's say you know anything from your life where people may recognize themselves in the book oh yeah um, <laughs> no I mean there are certain people in my life who maybe were initial inspirations or I myself may have been an initial inspiration for a character <laughs> in there, but it's very much a jumping off point. Uh, and everybody in there is a combination of a whole bunch of different people and things I've read about or seen or just come up with completely from my own imagination. So I have had to give disclaimers, though, of like, hey, I have not actually done all of the things that this main character does. Please don't think that I have, because there's a scene in the first chapter that has inspired some people to be a little worried about me, <laughs> <laughs> but I'm fine. <laughs> Good, we're, we're yeah. definitely happy about that. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> now, uh, in terms of, for example, writing is a very, you know, everyone knows it's very creative and very difficult process. How would you describe in terms of the, the pitching process uh, once you completed the work and you are you know pitching it to agents or publishers, what's that process like? Yeah, uh, I got very lucky in that process. I mean, you always hear people say that getting a book published is a combination of hard work and luck, and I think that's absolutely true. That's what this whole process taught me. Uh, so after I finished writing the manuscript and I had a draft that I was proud of and I'd showed it to some friends and gotten their feedback, I started drafting query letters to agents, but while I was doing that, I also simultaneously sent it to anyone I knew who had any connections with the publishing industry, uh, just to be like, what do you think of this? What should I do next? Do you have anybody I should contact? And incredibly, one of those people who I'd only met once uh, liked it enough to pass it on to some people that he knew, and it made its way into the hands of an editor, and she called me up one day, and we had this incredible hour-long conversation about how she saw the book, and luckily we aligned, and then I got the book deal from that. But, you know, the whole process, I always think about it in terms of instead of having a shoulder angel and a shoulder devil, you have like a shoulder Eeyore and a shoulder egomaniac, you know? And the shoulder Eeyore is like, oh, wah, wah, I'm not gonna fight for myself. If I'm lucky, my family and friends will read it. I hope they like it and they don't have to lie to me. Um, and the egomaniac is like, give me everything. I deserve a movie and I should get a million dollar advance. Ah. So yeah, the whole, publishing processes balancing those two. Nice. Well, I understand that you're going to uh, share an excerpt from this book, so I'm very yeah. excited to hear uh, you share um, a part of The Summertime Girls. Thank so we're, you. we're actually going to hear that now. This section takes place on Allie and Beth's first night back at Grandma Stella's house after a long period of not talking to each other. In the dark that night, Allie lay in the fetal position, facing the wall. She couldn't sleep. Since they'd flicked off the lights, she'd been trying not to toss around, not to disturb her bedmate. For what seemed like the thousandth time, she replayed the argument she'd been having in her mind since Beth first got back in touch about whether to confront her. Continuing to pretend that nothing was wrong, they'd just keep awkwardly, painfully butting up against that invisible bulwark between them, denying all the while that it existed. Quickly, before she could change her mind, she turned back to Beth, who lay flat and still on her back. Hey, she said, you awake? Mm. Beth's voice sounded thick and crackly, the voice of a teacher who'd spent the whole day screaming to be heard. Yep. Can we talk for a bit? The moon outside the window lit up the room enough that Allie could see Beth's eyes focus on her, but she couldn't make out their expression. Trepidation or impatience? Sure, Beth said, sounding more alert. What's going on? I just... Where did you go? Beth was silent, so Allie forced a laugh as she continued. I mean, obviously, I know you were in Haiti and you were busy, but I sent you so many emails and you barely wrote me back. Nothing from December to the end of April. 
Still silence. Allie plowed on. I just really needed my best friend to be there for me, especially with all that awful shit going on in my life. It felt like I was sending the most vulnerable parts of myself into a void, this blankness where there used to be so much love and support. I was having a really terrible time and you weren't there. She waited, tensed and bare, feeling like she'd just cut herself open and proffered her insides in the most haphazard way. Though she'd spent months thinking about this conversation, she still didn't have any clue how it was supposed to go. That was great. So I'm get I'm getting the uh, you know the summertime girls is it seems like a very emotional uh, roller coaster. I, would you, is that the way you would describe it? Yeah, I think so. I think in the way that a relationship with a close friend can sometimes be an emotional <laughs> right. roller coaster. I tried to capture that in the book. <laughs> um, what advice would you give to let's say other writers that basically want to do exactly what you're doing? Uh, I would say definitely know what to fight for in your book but also be willing to listen to other people's criticisms and be willing to kill your darlings. <laughs> <laughs> and also, uh, you are a former AF alum. I am. And what, uh, what in terms of in your creative process uh, from, that, from that point in your life to now, how would you say you benefit from, from being an AF alum or you know, just in general from all the opportunities here in New York along the process? Well, AF was one of the first places in New York that was like, we want you to write for us. We think that what you write is worthwhile. So I think that really helped me start to build the confidence to believe that I had something worthwhile to say in here. So I feel very grateful to <laughs> you all for that. <laughs> so how long did it take you to complete this book from start to finish? Uh, I would say to do a draft, it was probably about 14 months. But then once I got the book deal, that was another year and a half until it came out. Wow. Yeah. And then have you already started work on this, another project? Yes, actually. I've finished a draft of a second novel that I'm really excited about, about a young woman who finds her dead mother's journal. Uh, and so we will see what happens with that. And then I'm also working on this web series with my friend called Emergency Contact, which I'm excited about because it combines my loves of writing and acting. So it's a great variety of projects going on. You're very Thanks. busy. Yeah, <laughs> I try to be. <laughs> and so for people that want to know about your work and uh, for your web series and everything, where should they go? laurahankin.com, or they can follow me on Twitter, at Laura Hankin, or I have a Facebook author page that should just be under Laura Hankin as well. <laughs> nice. If you're interested in reading Laura's book, it's available on Amazon.com, Barnes & Noble, and your local bookstore. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you. I'm Elliot Torres, and you're watching The Artist Forum. The Artist Forum. Get connected, be heard. The Artist Forum is a place where artists of all disciplines can network, collaborate, and showcase their work. Do you want to know when to catch us? Well, check us out on Facebook, Twitter, or sign up for our newsletter. You can also see us live on the web by Manhattan Neighborhood Network's MNN.org. On the Artist Forum, you'll see interviews with New York City's emerging talents in theater, dance, music, the visual arts, as well as the written word. We'll jump the velvet rope to get interviews with the entertainment industry's top insiders, as well as some of its underground talents. Expose yourself to the Artist Forum. Show us your work. Invite us to your performance. Do you have questions about the business? Do you need help better focusing on your career? Or maybe you just want to post information about an upcoming project? Well, log on to our website, theartistforum.org. The Artist Forum, on the pulse of community activities and events. I'm Elliot Torres, and I'll see you on The Artist Forum. Hi, I'm Haley Chancellor, a volunteer with the Artist Forum. And I'm Elliot Torres, host of the Artist Forum's television program, AFTV. We're here on set to tell you about our latest endeavor, the Artist Forum Festival of the Moving Image. This new film festival is a major endeavor for the Artist Forum, one we believe will greatly impact both underserved artists and the New York City arts community as a whole. The Artist Forum Festival of the Moving Image is a competitive program open worldwide to filmmakers of all levels, seeking to gain exposure in New York City's international market. With your help, this film festival will be a great platform to invigorate our city's cultural scene. Live screenings of the top entries will be showcased this spring at a theater in New York City followed by a panel discussion, Q&As, and many other fun-filled surprises leading up to our after party and award ceremony. While the Artist Forum strives to be financially independent, we need your help to make our inaugural film festival a terrific success. As of now, the upfront costs are just beyond our reach. 
We need $20,000 to complete our vision for the festival program, which promises to be a dynamic cultural event. Recognition for your generosity will be acknowledged in a variety of ways. In return for your support, we are offering numerous perks and public acknowledgement of your generosity. For more information about these opportunities, please check out our page on Indiegogo.com. Since we are 501c3, your donations are fully tax deductible. Please help us continue our support of independent filmmakers by making a donation to fund the Artist Forum Festival of the Moving Image. And please consider also sharing your support with others by encouraging friends, family, and your social media networks to donate as well. If we all do our part to enable talented filmmakers to continue creating and sharing their work, everyone benefits. On behalf of everyone at the Artist Forum, we'd like to thank you for your support. We look forward to having you join us in discovering the latest in unique and innovative filmmaking this spring at our festival in New York City. Welcome back to the Artist Forum. I'm your host, Elliot Torres. My next guest is a mixed media artist here in New York City, originally from DC. Welcome to the show, Stan Squirewell. Thank you, thank you. I'm happy uh, to have you here. I'm looking forward to talk about your, uh, your work because you're a mixed media artist mm -hmm. and I want you to explain to our audience what exactly that entails. Mixed media is just a mashup of everything. It, it just gives me the opportunity to create what I want in any medium that I feel. So I, I, I tend to gravitate towards that title rather than photographer or painter or anything like that because it sort of puts you in a confined space. So I like the idea of being able to explore. So mixed media could be whatever I choose for that to be. And you got your start in photography, correct? No, actually painting. Oh, I painted painting. For, okay. for several years and then moved into photography. And which one, is there one that you prefer? <sighs> well, I think where I am now is most important, but at one point I would say that I really enjoyed photography because it was a thing that kept up with my brain. It, it was, it, it's instant, it's quick, it, and I could do a thousand shots very quickly, uh, back to back to back. And it pretty much exactly did exactly what I, what I wanted it to do, was keep up with my ideas of sorts. Painting took me a long time. Um, I'm a messy painter, <laughs> and by the time I would find myself working through one piece, I would have thousands of other ideas and I would sort of lose that particular piece right there. So um, sticking to something was very difficult for me. I think I was one of them ADHD kind of children. <laughs> <laughs> I still am. I, I'm, I'm all over the place. I'm always okay. thinking about what, what I want to do next, how I want to do this, how I want to do that. So the work that I'm creating now is a very random process and, and, it, and it keeps my focus in that way. And you, uh, you've had recent exhibitions. Can you tell us a little bit about what, uh, what they were and what, they, what type of media you use for them? All right, my most recent one was at Rush Arts. Uh, I'm the 2015 artist in residence there. So I had Congrats. To, yes, thank you, thank you. I had the space for a whole, the whole summer. And uh, we just finished up with the exhibition there. But it was the work that I created over the summer, which is a blend of every thought <laughs> that I had over the summer, everything that I read over the summer. Um, and it was also like an exp exploration of uh, thought of sorts or, or practice, um, illustrating my life and the sequence of things that have, have happened most recently. You know, I had my first child recently and I s definitely saw that birth experience come full circle in my, my art and my practice. So do you find that most of your inspiration comes from your personal life? Yes, it comes from everything. Anything I read, uh, I could listen to something, I, I'll find inspiration from that. Um, anything, I, I walk down the street and see a person in a certain color and that'll spark an idea for something. Uh, I'm always looking at architecture too. I find architecture to be really uh, influential in my work because I, I, li I like the structures, you know, so. Are there particular architects or artists that uh, stand out for you? It's so many of them. I'll just name a few. Henry, his architecture is amazing. As far as color work, I love Sam Gilliam's work, Gerhard Richter. I'm a big Andy Warhol fan. I love his stuff. Um, Sheila Hicks, I love her, 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 her work. There's so many 
I guess I, I stick with just my, my hometown people who influenced me most though. There was an artist by the name of Ed Love who was a sculptor back in the day that blew my mind. Like, um, and he would just use bumpers from old cars and create these amazing abstract figures. Mm -hmm. So I mean, I, I saw in him the idea of uh, innovation. That was the first time that I saw something that creative uh, from seemingly nothing. Uh, and all my art teachers, Mel Davis from Duke Ellington School of the Arts, I'm a graduate of there, of course, and uh, Bill Harris, you know, I don't know if most people would know them, but they're great to me. So my, my hometown heroes have had a, a very, very, very much impact on my life and my what art a, career. What would you say in terms of the, your creative process and uh, when you create your projects, what, uh, can you explain what that process is and you know, do you close yourself in a room and you don't leave until you have something completed or how long that takes? Normally it starts off with an idea and, and, and I, I look at my process as being more like a playground. I'm playing in the sand. I'm always in the sandbox and exploring, digging, and moving things out and searching for something. And I find some little gold nugget here, a little thing there, and I f find a way of fusing those elements together. So the process is, as far as the new work is concerned, it's a very emotionally driven process. Uh, and, and I think that's, that was a challenge for myself this year. I wanted to find a feminine sensibility in my work. You know, rather than the work being so straightforward and modular and masculine, I wanted to find out what would it feel like to do something a little less controlled, something that's a little more free flowing. And so, this particular series of work that I have uh, now is definitely the biggest challenge I've, I've had to date. You know, um, and it's something, and it's not comfortable. There's a, a vulnerability of sort that I'm, I'm really in searching out and, and going through. And that vulnerability I'm loving right now because it, it gives me so much more experience, you know? And I find that through that experience, I gain a lot of wisdom about the material and about my visions and what is to come for, from that. And how do you find in terms of when you have an exhibition and you have your art on display, what is it like for you from your perspective of um, the reaction from the, uh, from the audience? Reaction is always something that I'm quite nervous of at times, but I always put the burden on the people. I don't worry about what people think about the work. However, I have found that what people say or their, uh, their experience with the work definitely informs me more, uh, but I think initially I'm the creator and I leave the creation to the people afterwards. After I make it, it's no longer mine. It's up to everyone else to grapple with the concepts and ideas and in whatever way they want to find uh, themselves in and out of the work. How long does it take you to decide that, oh, I finally have a collection of pieces, this is, I'm done with, uh, with this series, and uh, before you move on to the next? That's normally about a seven year cycle for me. I have about seven years. I've noticed that I work on something for seven years and after that, I move. It, it's, it's almost a, a natural thing for me at seven years is over, it's done. I've flushed that idea out, that concept is over, I'm moving on to something else. But it is something that is linear in the, in, in the aspect that one thing leads to the next thing. So for example, my paintings led to the photography. The things that I, and, and I never abandoned painting. Uh, I painted on my photographs, I painted my models. You know, so I, I still had that tactile thing going on with my hand. However, what I painted, I wanted to see in three dimension. And so that gave way to the work that I'm creating now. So as far as uh, things progressing, it's all really one series. It's all one body of work, but just chapters of it. It's almost like writing a book. It's like chapters okay. at a time. Mm -hmm. And what would you say are your, your future goals with your work? Future goals is more shows. Getting into major collections, uh, I'm, I'm in the Smithsonian down in D.C., in which I'm extremely Congrats, honored. Congrats, that's awesome. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And, and international shows. I think the work right now is, is much more mature uh, in the sense that it, it definitely challenges me and the viewers that everyone, when, when people see it, they have a response to it. Be it good or not so good, uh, the response is the thing that I'm going for. 
And okay. so um, <clears throat> I think that that's something that I would like to share with everyone. So the possibilities of taking the work overseas to other places and even to other parts of the country is what I'm looking forward to. And what would you, what advice would you give to other artists or aspiring artists who want to do what you're doing? What would you say to them? Fall in love with what you do. I mean, there's nothing more satisfying than falling in love with what you do and being able to do that every day. Uh, it's like, in order to gain wisdom, you have to wonder. You have to wonder, wonder, wonder. It, it's, that's just the key to it. And if you want skill, then you have to practice. So when you are totally invested in what you do, nothing will stand in your way to stop you from attaining what your goals are. So that's it. If you are passionate about it, passionate, go for it and keep that passion. Oh, mm -hmm. that's great advice. Yeah, yeah. And if people want to learn more about your work, where should they go? Stansquarewell.com. All my updates from our future shows are all there, as well as new bodies of work that I'll, I'll be adding periodically throughout the year. Perfect. Mm -hmm. Well, it was a pleasure having you here. Thank mm -hmm. you so much for coming, and uh, we look forward to you know seeing your future shows and uh, more exhibitions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. I'm your host, Elliot Torres, and we'll see you next time on The Artist Forum.